Awesome. So as I said earlier, my name is Caleb and I work with Minority Africa, um, which is, as we'll come to find out very soon, a publication that uses data-driven multimedia journalism to tell minority stories from across Africa. And I want to start first in Nigeria, which is where I'm from. This is a picture from a party that was thrown for women only. Um, in Nigeria, we know um, we have states stats that show that sexual harassment is, is rife. So women decided to create a space where they can throw parties for themselves alone. And then in Zimbabwe, we had a story on a group of traditional healers who, first by the COVID-19 pandemic, had an influx of clients for the first time in their life and then decided to just sort of have, like in general, they resisted the regularization of practice. And then finally in Uganda, where refugee children in the Chiangwali settlement have been using board games to learn as schools were closed, right? And what makes all of these stories important is simply the fact that we don't find them in mainstream media. So what's the problem? The problem is there's a misrepresentation, underrepresentation, and sometimes no representation of minorities in mainstream African media, which is caused by a variety of factors. One, we don't report on them as often as we should too. Even when we do, we don't do it the correct way. And three, we're just not interested, right? Um, and then of course, what's, I decided to pull some headlines from several papers. These are two that just stuck out to me. Sex workers continue to law truckers despite government warning, right? The word law here in, in this headline postulates something that I find very problematic, as though the truckers are not willingly going to sex workers themselves. Um, we have another one which says, refugee influx chose the eastern horn of Africa, which primarily means describing refugees as fleecing the system or choking the system, which is a problematic way of viewing them. But what's the answer? The answer is a platform like ours, which is Minority Africa, right? And where we do stories of minorities with fullness, agency, intent, and humanity. Um, this is a screenshot pulled from our website just yesterday. And now who do we cover? So we cover women, ethnic minorities, religious minorities. Um, this, the middle one is a picture we did on uh, like a group of boys in Uganda. Uh, yeah, and we do this because it prioritizes coverage for minorities and by minorities, which I think is a very huge way of sort of democratizing editorial control and ensuring that people who are featured in the story get to be the ones to tell the story. We also cover religious minorities, persons with disabilities, and uh, refugees, if I didn't say that earlier. So we do cover refugees as well. And we have section editors for each of our desks, sometimes enlisting the help of freelancers, who we think enable us to sort of prioritize the control of the sources in the stories we tell. And how do we do it? So we do it through a website, which I've shown you, which is www.minorityafrica.org. We also have a podcast that will be out early next year, a narrative podcast, which is done from on the ground and which features you know, sources from there. We have our newsletters on email. If you get them, say hi. And then we have uh, master classes. Also, we have an investigative journalism vertical called Minority Africa Accountable, which for us is about holding power accountable and investigating injustices against minorities. And then we have, of course, events. We have an e-learning platform. Um, yeah, so we, we have these various products that sort of like help us sort of reach our audiences at the most basic level. And now who is our audience, right? So I'll tell you about one of our audiences. He's Mukasa, he's 35 years old, he's a bank teller, drives a Subaru. Before Mukasa came to our website, he believed that refugees were a burden on the system, right? But after reading a few stories, he realized, oh my God, they actually do contribute to the system. And so the first thing Mukasa experienced was acceptance and then subsequent was awareness and then subsequently acceptance. I'll tell you about Zion. Now, Zion is 22 years old. They're non-binary, they're Nigerian in the UK, and they wanted to feel connected to themselves back home. So Zion comes on our websites, finds a community of people like them who have, you know, who are telling stories about people like them, and then they feel community and then freedom. And then we have Pierre. Now, Pierre is 22. He's an MP in Cameroon. Pierre knows that he has to advocate for the rights of persons with disabilities in his community, but he doesn't always do it, right? However, Pierre knows that Minority Africa is watching, right? So that sort of spurs him into being more accountable and also to ensure that the rights of the people in his community are properly represented. Now, who's our team? I just wanted to show you like a bit of us. There's me, of course, uh, we spread across six countries. There's the Shika in Mauritius, Shemir in Mauritius, Fumi in the UK, 
Florence, who's here in Uganda, and then Patricia, who's also here with me in Uganda. And we are just a bunch of incredible people. That's what I would say. You can Google us and find out. But we just have a stellar team, which also I think everyone sort of has a personal story as to why they're in the team. So how do we stay functioning? What's our revenue model, right? So we have a news agency, which is sort of helping news organizations across the world improve their coverage of minorities. We have master classes. We have an e-learning platform that's been built. We get donations from people. And we host online events for now, hopefully in person soon. And of course, grants, right? So what's our impact? So since we started in 2019, November, we have had 50 stories published. We've reached over 400,000 people. Um, yeah, and all of the stories have been spread across all of the categories we cover, right? So we've had stories on ethnic minorities, sexual minorities, religious minorities, persons with disabilities, and women. Um, we have over 7,000 plus followers on social media. We've been able to get over 700 plus newsletter subscribers, which has been incredible. Our newsletter, if you read it, is called the Minority Roundup, and it goes out from six different cities every week. Yes, every Sunday morning if you subscribe to it. Um, yeah, and we've also been able to sort of like grow our social media presence. Where have we gotten the money from? So 90.1% of the money we have has come from grants. We've got some revenue as well, which is around 5.5%, and we've received around 4.4% in donations. So in total, we have raised 40% of how much we intended to for the first two years of being in operations, which means we're not doing so bad in terms of raising money either. And you can join us at www.minorityafrica.org. Thank you. We're living in a, a new normal. How has uh, Minority Africa adjusted to the new normal in regards to their storytelling? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question because we've only really known the new normal. We started in November 2019 and like two months after we, it was COVID, right? So we really just had, there was, a, there was a lot of plans that we had for that 2020 that, that we couldn't do. And we had to sort of recenter our reporting. So we said, how can we ensure that we're prioritizing safety of uh, the people we work with? So we worked entirely remotely for the whole of last year. Um, so that's been normal for us. It's not, it's, it's sort of the only thing we've known, right? I think we're actually just adapting to being like working in person, in fact. 